Africa. to Issues and Answers, a production of the Government Information Service. I'm your host, Jacques Hinson Compton. And today we're going to be talking about UNICEF, its general purpose in the Eastern Caribbean. And my guest today is Mr. Peter Bolt, who is the UNICEF representative for the Eastern Caribbean. Uh, welcome to the program. Thanks, Jacques. I'm really happy to be here. It's good to have you here. So for those of us who don't know, I want you to tell us a little bit about uh, UNICEF's general purpose around the world. Yes, UNICEF, or the United Nations Children's Fund, is a global organization, a global child rights organization. Uh, we are present in almost every country in the world, and we work in almost any condition around the world, um, um, be it sometimes humanitarian crisis uh, in development settings, but also focusing on children's rights in many other countries. Okay, so, do, so you, do you generally get a lot of, um, you go to, let's, let's say, war-torn countries, uh, countries affected by uh, e extreme natural disasters or anything like that? We are there on the ground, so uh, in, in almost every country. So we adapt very quickly uh, in if the situation is changes, changes. For instance, I'm just coming from uh, Romania uh, and I moved to the, to the Eastern Caribbean region, but uh, we had to quickly change gears in Romania because of the Ukraine war. And uh, Romania received almost a million and a half refugees in the last couple of months. Uh, most of them being women and children, so we had to adapt, but I think UNICEF is very capable of adapting to local context, and local context can change very quickly, as I think you know in, in St. Lucia as well and in this region, because of the natural disasters. Mm. So, uh, and why don't you tell us a little bit about your, your own personal background? Yeah. Um, so, I'm a teacher, originally. Mm. Um, I taught in high school for a few years. Um, then I moved back to school myself, and... Mm. Uh, got involved into international relations and uh, joined UNICEF actually in this region uh, in 1994. Mm. Um, I, uh, I'm married, I have four children, and two of them will join me here in the region, and two of them are actually uh, working and studying in the Netherlands. Oh good, are they going to move here permanently or just turn a visit? Uh, no, uh, me and my family will move here permanently, semi -per permanently mm. within the United Nations system, uh, we have a rotation policy. Mm. So in the international, uh, in the international uh, segment, you kind of move every four or five years, depending again on the context where you are. If you're in a humanitarian crisis, mm. it's usually a, a bit faster. Uh, but uh, here in uh, the Caribbean, I hope to stay for at least four or five years. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so you've been, well, you, so you've been in the region since 1994. Uh, <laughs> not in the region. Yeah. Uh, my first posting was in Barbados, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, at that time, uh, I was uh, responsible for Suriname more. So I didn't get to know most, many of the islands mm -hmm. uh, because I did a lot of travel and work in Suriname. But we didn't have an office at that time in Suriname. Now we do. Um, and uh, I worked from Bar Barbados as a base, basically. So that was 94, but then since then I uh, did seven moves and I worked in Indonesia, in the state of Palestine, in India, and then Romania and in the U.S. in the headquarters. I also had uh, a few years as well. Okay, and so I'm kind of coming full circle back to the Caribbean. Yeah. So you've had an extensive career in, 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 um, in sort of diplomacy, I, I guess. Diplomacy, but uh, really kind of standing up for children's rights, you mm. know, because no matter what country you are, no matter how developed, really, uh, uh, challenges remain. And with the Convention of the Rights of the Child, we have a really holistic uh, mandate in terms of focusing on children's rights, ranging from, I don't know, protecting children, protecting, I don't know, kind of even in Europe now, we're dealing with, uh, with migrant children, with refugee children. So you see that some of the countries that, I don't know, on paper are quite well developed, uh, we're still providing assistance with some of these kind of uh, situations. Okay. And why don't you tell us, um, I mean, in detail about your mission specifically in St. Lucia? Yes. Um, I had a short mission, but it's one of my first, my first missions. Uh, uh, of course, um, being based in, for working for the Eastern Caribbean, we cover 12 countries. So that's quite an agenda, I would say. Uh, so I'm 
very happy that St. Lucia is among the first countries uh, to visit. Um, mm -hmm. I had a very good visit. My, my main purpose, I, I can't claim to know everything about St. Lucia, about the region. So my first weeks, and I literally started three weeks ago, my first weeks are really to learn. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I mentioned earlier the, uh, the adaptability of UNICEF, and I think for us it's always important to understand the local context, okay. the local situation of children, what are the challenges. There are similar similarities, there are things you can read about that, but nothing beats actually visiting the island, meeting with the communities, meeting with uh, the officials, meeting with civil society, and, and, and learning about uh, what, uh, what, uh, what, uh, what the situation of children is and what the main challenges are that, uh, that children are facing. Yeah, so I know you've only been here a, a few days, but how do you like St. Lucia so far? <laughs> It struck me how beautiful and how green it is. I knew it was going to be beautiful, mm -hmm. but I, it struck me, and I'm telling my, my colleagues and everybody, like, it's really green. Mm -hmm. it's, it, its natural resources are just spectacular, and the people have been more than welcoming, I would say. From, from government side to everybody I meet, it's been uh, a very warm, uh, warm visit, and I, I go back to Barbados this evening mm -hmm. uh, with a very, uh, very strong sense of... Uh, of, uh, of collaboration, of companionship with, with the country. So in that way, uh, I would like to thank I know everybody in St. Lucia for somehow the way of welcoming people and making them feel uh, part of the community. So also I had a you know, number of very good meetings with, uh, with the prime minister, with mm -hmm. several ministers, ministries, and uh, again, to learn, mm -hmm. uh, but also, I know, to kind of build up a, 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 a strong connection with them because, I know, we, we are partnering in terms of uh, uh, fighting for children's rights and, uh, mm -hmm. and I think UNICEF doesn't claim to be able to change the conditions on our own. Mm -hmm. It has to be done through these kind of partnerships. And I, I hope your, your meetings with the, uh, the Prime Minister were quite productive. They were productive. Uh, I learned about the, the youth economy which is, I think, uh, I know, and I learned uh, particularly about, uh, I know, um, this is, I think, one of the challenges, not just in, uh, in, uh, in, 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 in St. Lucia or in the Caribbean. I think we see it in different parts of, uh, of, of the world that uh, youth unemployment is a really big issue. And I think to address it, we need to start early. We need to start with children, investing in children, um, m investing in education programs for all children, but also making sure that our education programs are relevant for what society needs today. And I think here there's some work to be done. Uh, so I think, yes, it was a very productive meeting, uh, a very first meeting, uh, but, uh, um, and since then I learned from several of the other ministries a lot more about what is already being done in terms of building up this youth economy, but also in terms of working on education, working in the health sector, working on social protection and social services. Mm -hmm. um, so in that way, uh, I, I am getting a, a good sense that there is a, a strong sense about uh, the challenge, cha understanding about the challenges, mm -hmm. and also uh, I know, a clear strategy in terms of how to address that. Okay, uh, we're due for our first break. Uh, when we get back, I, want to, I know we've spoken about your mission in St. Lucia, but I want to talk about your mission in the, the wider Caribbean. Okay. So we'll be back in a moment. Please stay tuned. And kindling our consciousness, Emancipation 2022 presents the Lawaz Festival Guafet. A burst of color, culture, food and entertainment at the Constitution Park on William Peter Boulevard, Castries, Tuesday, August 30th at 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Come be part of a cultural sensory experience. For more information, go to CDF Facebook page. Participating partners, Government of St. Lucia, CDF, NRC, Umbutu, ICA, NYC, FRC, Denry North and South Constituency, Sufre Council, Sufre Foundation, Archaeological and Historical Historical Society, SLHTA, and Events St. Lucia. Welcome back. You're watching Issues and Answers. I'm here with Mr. Peter Bolt, who is the UNICEF representative for the Eastern Caribbean. Now, before we went on the break, we were talking about your mission, specifically in St. Lucia. So I, wanted to, I want you to tell us about the, your mission in the wider Eastern Caribbean. Yes. Um, so our mission is really to support children in, in, their, in terms of better developing them, better protecting them, um, 
in terms of you know, ensuring that they can meet uh, a grow to their best potential. Um, so our work in the Caribbean is focusing on, on 12 countries, but as UNICEF, we are also present with other offices, which I'm not directly responsible for in the other parts of the Caribbean. So my focus is really on the Eastern Caribbean. Um, the, um, the, the real challenges I see is, I mean, first of all, I think a lot of progress has been made, let me say that. I think uh, since many countries, and Lucia signed uh, and ratified the International Convention on the Rights of the Child mm -hmm. in uh, 1993, very early on after the uh, inception of that convention, and I think many other countries did at the same time, and I think a lot of progress has been made since then. A lot of progress has been made specifically in the health sector. We've been reducing mortality. We've been providing access, uh, good access to uh, maternal and child health. A lot of progress has been made in education in terms of enrollment rates for children. S uh, protecting, I think today's children are better protected than they were at that time, protected from violence. But, but that said, I think we also know that there are a number of different challenges. Old challenges, uh, challenges that existed then and which we continue to have to work on, but also a lot of new challenges because, uh, I know, the last couple of years has been quite uh, uh, unique from many different angles. I mean, uh, uh, the COVID pandemic has added a lot of additional strain on children. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say that children actually bear the brunt of the pandemic. Um, their mental health, the lockdowns have affected their mental health, mm -hmm. have affected, affected their psychosocial well-being, uh, but also their education. Um, many children, were not able to follow the online learning. Uh, um, and I think even more than half probably were not able to follow the online learning. So really lost two years of education. Um, poverty has increased during the pandemic. Uh, we, we noted uh, an increase of violence, domestic violence, families being at home, not being able to go, no livelihoods, in increasing demands and pressures on, uh, on, on, the, on the households affecting the mental health, but also uh, resulting in increased violence. So I think the pandemic has done a lot of damage, children being really, uh, 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 being really kind of uh, bear the brunt of that. And, uh, and this is, I think, something that now coming out of the pandemic, we really have to focus on and, uh, and, and, you know, and, and, and address that increase of poverty is, is a, a real big concern. Actually, the inequalities increased because those uh, children, for instance, that that were not been able to access online learning were already the children probably who were not in the most, uh, on the most uh, favorable conditions. So th their gap, because now they lost two years of learning on top of that, mm -hmm. uh, is really big. So we really have to think uh, about, okay, what this has done to our societies and what we now need to do to be able to address that. We can't gloss over and go back with business as usual. Mm -hmm. I think we really have to put some systems in place. But that's also an opportunity, and I think as UNICEF we see this also as an opportunity. I mean, the most obvious one is, for instance, the, on, the online environment, okay? Mm -hmm. We were not successful in making sure that all children uh, were able to access learning, but we did learn that online learning and using digital tools in the classroom and to educate our children is feasible <laughs> and possible. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, we have to now use the coming years to really um, use that to our advantage, and I know, complement the teacher with digital tools and, and, and facilities to strengthen the learning because as I, I referred to earlier, the, 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 the relevance of our education is not, uh, is not as, uh, as it was before. Um, the skills that young people need to have to be able to um, be a productive member of society, to be a, a good employee, are not the same as what they used to be. And I think I don't think the education sector, and this is not in St. Lucia, this is not in the Caribbean alone. Mm -hmm. This is a global challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, the education system needs to reform significantly. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think this is why the pandemic has opened our eyes to this, has already brought some of these uh, technologies into the classroom, which we now have to explore, because that is part of, I think, the reform agenda, continue going forward with uh, bringing stronger technology into the agenda. But also learning different skills. Um, skills that are uh, allowing children to become more resilient, more independent, more, uh, more communicative, more uh, collaborative. Mm -hmm. um, so we need to bring in a new type of skill set. Not to do away with some of the basic skills because what the, the other part of the learning crisis is, is, um, is that actually some of our children, a large part of our children, come out of the education system not being able to 
have the basic skills, uh, being able to properly read or write. Again, this is a, a, global, a global challenge. The Secretary General of the United Nations has called and uh, together with UNICEF is organizing a, a global summit uh, in next month and uh, your government has already prepared a little analysis on, uh, on the situation of education in, uh, in Saint Lucia and will go to that summit as well to be able to debate what needs to happen globally in terms of the education sector and how this reform can, can, take, uh, can take shape. Because that needs to change, we all agree on. Now how? We have the, some of the ingredients, but I think here we need to, as a world, collectively learn. And I think this, this is one of the strengths of UNICEF being present in so many countries, having so many different experiences, uh, not having recipes uh, that are valid for all countries, but learn from all countries. But things can be shared. So this is, I think, a real uh, opportunity. So education is, um, is one of the, the big challenges. Um, Addressing poverty, which is, oh no, can also be done through education, because I think education is a strong mm -hmm. strategy to fight poverty. Uh, but also we need to strengthen the overall uh, uh, social protection programs around the region. And again, here in St. Lucia, we have a strong partnership uh, uh, with your government to be able to already strengthen the social protection program, to better target social protection programs. Mm -hmm. But not to only look at the cash component, but also to uh, at the, the cash transfer component, but also to look at uh, the service provision. And I think here I, 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 I see a strong need across the Caribbean, at least the countries I've visited so far, to really uh, reconnect a uh, vulnerable household to basic services at the local level um, and make those services more agile and more proactive vis-a-vis -vis vulnerable households. Vulnerable households are struggling on a day-to-day -day basis. We're making ends meet, uh, uh, have, have typically a larger number of children. So. They, their threshold to access even a very local government service is very, very high. They won't. Uh, we need to kind of relook at the social service provision and see how we can knock on the children on the, on the families' doors rather than waiting for the poor vulnerable families to come to uh, to the to the service to be able to connect them into the programs that are available because programs are available to support them. There are good social protection programs. There are good services available, but vulnerable households need a, a little bit of a push or a little bit of a help to connect and this requires a different mindset of some of our social services it also requires a better connecting of social services uh, with each other um, so the connection of a local health uh, 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 clinic to uh, the social worker in the community mm -hmm. to the school counselor in the school and I think those three professionals probably supported by some of the other influences at the local level can actually ensure that vulnerable families don't remain in their isolation and don't get deeper into, into the vicious cycle of poverty, but actually can be helped to, to take out of poverty. Again, I think there's enough resources in the Caribbean, human resources, funding to be able to do this, but it requires a different mindset, a different way of working at the local level. And I can see this uh, would be tremendously beneficial for, uh, for fighting poverty specifically. So this is something in the social protection, social services uh, area we're working on. Um, I can talk about many <laughs> other areas, uh, but uh, I'll let you uh, maybe. Yeah, um, um, it's, it's actually interesting that you, you mentioned social protection because on another episode of Issues and Answers I had with the Ministry of Equity, yeah. they were speaking about um, uh, reforming our, our social protection policy and, and legislative reform. Yeah. Um, so I know we're, at least we're on the right path for now in St. Lucia. You are on the right path and what I'm talking about is something that I think we're working on collaboratively already. I mm -hmm. mean, again, uh, uh, we are very much adapting to what's here and I think I know the government has done a lot of work in terms of social protection, in terms of reforming the law um, and, and, and it also wants to continuously learn in terms of how to better uh, reach the most vulnerable. And we're facing a, a larger a number of, of, of most vulnerable these days. And mm -hmm. We're facing new challenges. Um, one thing I also, if I may, t talk a little bit about is, mm -hmm. uh, is actually engaging children and young people directly into this work. Mm -hmm. I'm, 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 and UNICEF, I think, is a strong uh, advocate for uh, uh, giving children a voice. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not talking about only young, 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 young people or youth. I'm talking even from the youngest age possible, because you can give a voice to a child at any age, at the family level, first of all, or at the school level, 
or in the community or in the clubs and, uh, and, and, and the associations that they're part of mm -hmm. um, or in governance. Um, so I, I'm, I'm a strong believer that this is absolutely critical for the future of a country. We need to listen more to our young people, to our children. Uh, we need to try to, I don't know, encourage them to participate, uh, empower them to participate and, uh, at all these levels. Um, and I think that can make a really change in the outlook of how we look at some of the problems that we continue to face and, and help us find new solutions, but also help prepare a more um, a stronger community from the start, because I think we need to rebuild that community uh, 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 everywhere around the world. I mm -hmm. see it everywhere. Well, I said, as I mentioned I come from Romania. Here mm -hmm. also we need to really, uh, uh, I know, um, we bring children in engagement, volunteerism, uh, uh, taking part of your community, taking part of like keeping your community safe, keeping your, mm -hmm. so recognizing if there's any challenges or any problems and tackling them early on. You need a strong community for that. Yeah, um, I, I totally agree. Um, I wanted to continue, yeah. but we're due for our second and final break. Okay. So just stay with us for a little while. Okay. Uh, we'll continue along your, your line of thought. Okay. You're watching Issues and Answers. Please stay tuned. We'll be back in a few moments. Keeping hands clean is important for good health. However, after a disaster, staying clean is hard to do, especially if there is no pipe borne water. Simple things you can do to stay clean and remain healthy are wash your hands with soap and clean water. If these are not available, sanitizers with alcohol are options. Wash your hands many times during the day, before preparing food, eating, caring for a sick person or baby, treating a cut, wound, or sore. Wash hands after using the bathroom, changing diapers, caring for animals, caring for sick or injured persons after handling garbage. Washing your hands is one of the best ways to prevent illness. For further information, contact the Bureau of Health Education at telephone number 468-5349. Welcome back to Issues and Answers. We're here with the UNICEF representative for the Eastern Caribbean, Mr. Peter Bolt. And before we went on the break, you were talking about uh, engagement with children, especially yes. to, to encourage them into your line of work. Yes. I think this, this, uh, this is extremely important. Um, children make up 20-25% I think of the solution, solution population. Globally it's more like 40% of the global population. And we're not, we're not engaging that resource. <laughs> children have ideas, children have thoughts, children see the world around them and look actually at the world in a very different, with very different eyes. Um, so one thing why we need to change and change good, not because of it's simply their right to participate, which is mm -hmm. it, which it is. It's actually one of the rights of the convention, but it's also a, f a need uh, for them to participate because they still think very differently than us. They are not yet compartmentalized in their thinking. They're not yet have uh, big family responsibilities that weigh into their thinking. They're open-minded, and I think the world needs open-minded ideas and open-minded thoughts. It's not for nothing that we see that some of the biggest climate change activists are actually children who are basically driving uh, the advocacy agenda on, 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 on change for the climate. Uh, so I think this is where we need what we need to do in every society, work with our children from an early age on, give them a voice, listen to them, and, and try to like bring some of these ideas into the decisions that we take at every level at the school level, mm -hmm. uh, engage them in the school and how the school is being managed, how the school is, like how, teachers, how students are learning in the school. But then, oh no, going up also, give them a space. Uh, I mean, you know, I know you have youth programs or uh, mm -hmm. I hope you also bring children into your program to talk and listen to them because they really have something to say and they really have opinions about what things need to change. And I think we need this in this world because globally, again speaking, we see inequalities rising. Uh, we see conflict not abiding, actually conflicts increasing around the world. Mm -hmm. We see uh, education becoming less relevant. We see climate, the climate crisis um, I know, getting worse and worse. Uh, uh, so I think we need new solutions, we need new ideas. 25% mm -hmm. or 40% at the global level of people are not used in that decision making. Let's work with them and then use them. And I think I'm a really strong believer on this. This is something I would really like to work with the uh, St. Lucian government on as well. We had some discussions around that with some of your uh, 
your um, your officials, and mm -hmm. I think I'm really hopeful that we can build this base uh, of engagement with uh, with children. Um, closely linked to that is we we often see children as a charitable it's like the recipient of something mm -hmm. the recipient of education the recipient of a of 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 of, 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 of a gift or of, of a service but we need to start seeing them more as an active active citizen as an mm -hmm. active engager we need to invest in them also consciously invest in their education invest in their protection invest in their health because when you do this early on, even at age one or two, you know, you, when you invest in them, you recognize problems early on if there are certain challenges. But you also build and develop them early on uh, to be a responsible, productive, active, positive, happy citizen. Mm -hmm. And I think for that, it requires conscious, uh, uh, conscious investments, uh, a real strategy of investment in, 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 in children. And I think. This is what I'm really looking forward to work with the solution government on as well to, to, to bring this kind of uh, no, consistent effort and consistent investment mm -hmm. in terms of the children's uh, in, in, in children directly and in, in all their all their aspects of uh, development. Um, within the the Saint Lucian government, uh, and I don't know if there are any um, outside organizations. Are, are there any organizations both in Saint Lucia and, and maybe Caribbean wide? that you work with to, to push this forward, or do you provide technical assistance to any of these organizations? Yes, we do. I mean, uh, technics is, is a big part of our work, uh, uh, but also not just with the government. Uh, we, we connect very closely with civil society organizations, but also the, the, uh, the regional organizations that exist. I mean, you're, you're the home of the OACS, uh, so this is a really important partner for us as well, because we, we try to learn from what happens in the different countries, and we try to scale that and replicate that to other 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 countries. As UNICEF, I think we we're really trying to kind of um, have this kind of knowledge uh, sharing, uh, and I think the OECS is has a strong program on this, and we're really working through the OECS to make sure that I don't know there's a lot of learning taking place, that there's not a repetition of of things to learn in in different countries. Uh, so I think in this, in this case, I think, uh, yeah, OECS is, is, is a really strong partner, um, CARICOM, uh, but we also have a lot of uh, other uh, uh, I know, uh, national uh, embassies that are supporting us, and we are supporting them mm -hmm. with the work uh, that we're doing uh, around the region. Um, more and more, I'd like to associate with youth, youth organizations and mm -hmm. child-led organizations as well. Uh, um, some of the countries in Eastern Caribbean have youth parliaments, active ongoing youth parliaments and I think that's a, a really good initiative as well. They are looking at policies and, and laws from a, from a uh, lawmaking from a, from a young person's perspective and, mm -hmm. and, and bring that then to, to the, uh, the, 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 the legal decision making in the country. So I think that kind of support. So uh, business sector, not to forget the business sector because I think mm -hmm. uh, business sector has a strong role to play when it comes to uh, uh, in, yeah, strengthening human development. Uh, they have strong interest from it as well. I mean, just mentioned education. I mean, um, it's the business sector that, if the education sector is not functioning, it's the business sector that suffers uh, a lot of it <laughs> because they will not be able to get the uh, the caliber of uh, of of, of sk or the quality of skills and uh, and the caliber of people that they need. So mm -hmm. the business sector is 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 very engaged in in terms of young people, and we collaborate also with business sector. Okay, where are uh very close to the end of the program, yeah. but I wanted to very briefly before we go off air, uh, what sort of future challenges to, do you foresee in the, in the case of advancing children's causes? I know you've spoken about your challenges under COVID-19 and so forth, yeah. but what, uh, just very briefly, some future challenges. Yeah, um, I spoke about a lot of the, the challenges, I think, and in, in a lot of them that I want to, wanted to mention, I think I've mentioned uh, the COVID and the follow-up on the pandemic, getting out of the pandemic. Uh, the increasing poverty that we can see around the region. Um, I mentioned on child engagement, but one last point maybe is to say, is to talk a bit more about the climate and the risks that come with climate change, which I know this region is, uh, is no stranger to, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of uh, our work around the region is also in terms of uh, trying to prepare countries for future hurricanes, earthquakes, mm -hmm. volcanic eruptions, uh, tsunamis, 
uh, to be able to be better prepared. So poverty reduction is key because we need to build resilience of people, first of all, and I think poverty reduction is a key part of that resilience. But we also need to pr pr make uh, safe schools. We need to prepare the young people to be able to uh, support and prepare them for these natural disasters and to be help contribute. So I think a lot of our work is also focusing on uh, uh, disaster risk reduction, building or making systems and also policies that are and programs of national governments that are shock, uh, shock resistant, mm -hmm. um, etc. So and, and educate and, and bring young people again into this discussion as well, because mm -hmm. they will have ideas on how to do this and their awareness and their involvement is also key when it comes to uh, making the country safer and less, less vulnerable to these kind of shocks. Okay, brilliant. I want to thank you very much for coming on our program. I know you have a busy agenda and you, you, you do need to get out, but I do hope that you can come back another time, hopefully in the next few months or whenever you're back in St. Lucia, and we can talk again. Anytime. I'm looking forward. Thank you so much, Jack. Thank you. Yeah. You're watching Issues and Answers. Uh, I thank you for watching, and please stay tuned to the National Television Network for additional programming, and please follow us on Facebook and YouTube. Thank you for watching.